Oh, you, you can re record when we actually start. All right, all right. So I'll pause the game. Yeah. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening. <clears throat> Selamat malam. Thank you for all participants. Thank you for speakers, distinguished speakers who have uh, uh, kindly agreed to participate in our webinar today. Uh, this webinar will be conducted in two languages. In fact, uh, from the audience that we have now, most of our audience are Indonesian. So later, uh, I will translate back and forth between uh, Indonesian and English, especially from Indonesian to English. Uh, our topic today, let me start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, all right. Again. Our topic today is economic recovery and resurgence. Uh, we actually uh, it's somehow refreshing. We actually have three sessions for the webinars. Uh, First is the monetary sovereignty session, which is today, followed by job guarantee session, which is on Wednesday, and uh, industrial policy session uh, on Friday. And our speakers today are Professor Fadil Kabub. Uh, he is uh, Professor at Denison University of Economics here. Yeah? And I have, uh, if uh, I will share the material later, uh, this presentation on YouTube, the link to the presentation and uh, the underlying materials are all clickable. So you can find out more information by clicking on the link. And uh, Fadel Kabu is also the president of Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, uh, which is uh, a non-government organization ba based in the U.S. And the purpose of the organization is as reflected in the name for sustainable uh, uh, prosperity, not only for the United States, but also for the entire world. And he is, of course, as I told you, an academic, also an activist. Uh, he, uh, he often meets with activists, educates activists, and share with activists strategies uh, on how to uh, design uh, uh, winning programs for uh, elections. And uh, of course, he is also an all-around good person. He has been very kind for us here in Indonesia. He has been helping us with our effort and. Uh, we hope to meet him someday when the pandemic uh, situation has subsided. Our second speaker today is uh, Mr. Sohibul Ansor Sirega. He's a doctoral candidate for 10 years now, or perhaps uh, uh, more than five years, maybe not yet 10 years. But in terms of uh, writing output, he is extremely prolific, writing almost daily, published almost daily by uh, many uh, media here in uh, Medan, North Sumatra, and Indonesia. He is the general coordinator for Pengembangan Basis Social Inisiatif dan Swadaya. Uh, uh, roughly translated, it is the development of social uh, and social basis, the development of independent social basis, or shortened as N basis. And when you click the link, you can go to his uh, website. Uh, later, you can click the link. And he's also a lecturer at uh, Universitas Muhammadiyah Sumatra Utara. Uh, so he's a very prominent person in Muhammadiyah, not only uh, regionally, but also nationally. He is the head of the Wisdom and Public Policy Unit in uh, North Sumatra uh, Muhammadiyah. Uh, uh, committee and as uh, Prof. Fadil Kabuf, he is also an academic, as I told you, an activist like Prof. Fadil, exactly like Prof. Fadil actually, 
maybe even more because uh, uh, Pak Sohibul is known as a political consultant here in Medan and North Sumatra. And uh, of course, an all around good person. He has been helping me uh, here. Is, this is me, one woman, and my wife here, yeah? Afrilia. Both of us are the uh, founder of uh, Indonesian Independent Intellectual. And you can see our picture here uh, in front or by the side of uh, Lake Toba, a very famous lake, not only in Medan, North Sumatra, Indonesia, but the world. The lake, uh, the mountain, the Toba mountain, they changed the landscape of humankind uh, 70,000 years ago, perhaps, I think, if uh, our my memory is correct. And this was taken mid-2019 before the pandemic at uh, an international event there, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, literature, Batak literature, if I'm not mistaken. So we have, uh, I and my wife, this is our effort for MMT in Indonesia. We have translated the uh, macroeconomics textbook and the translation can be seen at the link there, clickable. And regarding translations, we have done a lot more translations. Uh, we have published uh, modernmoneybasics.com by uh, 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 Geoff Coventry from, yeah, Geoff Coventry, I think. He was the creator of that website or the coordinator. Uh, uh, title uh, Monetar Modern, Modern Monetary, Modern Money, simply. It's not monetary, yeah? Modern Money in Waspada newspaper. Uh, Waspada newspaper is a locally printed newspaper, but uh, nationally distributed. So people in Jakarta, in Surabaya, in Jogja, even in East Indonesia, thousands of kilometers away from here also reading it. Uh, we have sent about 13 columns. So, so far they have published five columns on it. And we have contextualized MMT to the Indonesian context. Uh, we call it constitutional microeconomics because believe it or not, Indonesia since 1945 has actually obligated both job guarantee and basic income. So unlike other, uh, other countries maybe, or unlike other people who may debate uh, these two policies. We don't have a choice here in Indonesia. We must implement both. And as we know, MMT is all about law. Everything can be derived from law. And this is our nation's social contract. Article 27, uh, uh, clause two, yeah? Every citizen has the right to have uh, dignified work and dignified life, yeah? And uh, an elaboration of that can be seen at the second link here, s.id slash jamppi, Jaminan Pekerjaan dan Penghidupan Indonesia, JAMPI. And also, we have written many more articles. Uh, on this, I will elaborate later. So, we have also presented uh, both modern monetary theory and job guarantee policy in many events. These are some of the events at an activist events, the first one, uh, the second link at a religious uh, conference, a conference in which uh, influential religious people in North Sumatra are present. And this one, the third one is for the Medan uh, mayor himself, yeah, the mayor of Medan. And the last one is for the uh, governor of North Sumatra. So we presented uh, uh, for very uh, 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 important or very influential people here in Medan and North Sumatra. And we have also wrote to Indonesian leaders. This is the first one is for the president. Uh, the second one is for the finance minister, the country director or the managing director for the World Bank, Mari Elka Pangestu, who is from Indonesia, and the United Nations uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural uh, uh, Secretariat in Thailand, yeah, Bu Armida Ali Shahbana. So this is our letter to them. And we have also networked with academics and activists from, from all over the world through emails, sometimes Zoom, yeah? Uh, and other means of communication, WhatsApp also. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So I would like to share a bit on uh, our currency, Indonesian currency, which is the rupiah. 
I can see uh, Gulam Muhammad raise hand, perhaps uh, later uh, uh, during the question and answer session, you can ask uh, your questions or you can uh, chat, yeah? And whenever we have time, our speakers or our other uh, participants can answer any of your questions or can discuss with you what you have in mind. So I would like to share uh, a bit on the Indonesian currency because our topic today is monetary uh, sovereignty. Yeah, one spool also raised hand, uh, same principle, yeah? So this is from Kristanto Ibisono, who is the founder of Indonesian Business Data Center. And he has written, I'm sorry for the noise, now is uh, Isha time, uh, after or evening prayer, night prayer in Indonesia. I think uh, I can still continue. Pardon? No, no, I'm, I'm going to share, yeah. So, we have uh, here, I have collected three articles from Cristanto Ibisono. Uh, first is, all of them are on Rupiah. And the first is on the development of Rupiah after 75 years. So this year is the 75 uh, uh, year of independence for Indonesia. And so is the Rupiah. Uh, and the second, uh, on the interaction between uh, the finance minister and the central bank governor and on the rupiah uh, uh, devaluation also and the third one uh, is an article written for compass on the president and the rupiah uh, exchange rate i'm sorry there was apparently it's four yeah not three uh, the fourth one is also the same like the second one uh, whether the finance minister and the uh, central bank governor, whether they, they are, one moment, yeah. Somebody is not si silencing uh, their. Uh, please silence your plus. Please mute your speakers. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. And the fourth one, the same as the second one, uh, whether the. Finance Minister and the Central bank, bank Governor, whether they are having a duet or a duel. So let's see this article briefly. Yeah? Uh, okay, so we can see here uh, in the infographic that these are the changes, basically uh, devaluations in the rupiah uh, from 1950 to 1998 uh, and he has written a bit more detail here uh, bigger so let's look at it yeah so during the first president's uh, time Bung Karno for about he led for about 15 to 20 years I think I think 20 years yeah 45 to 65 yeah uh, maybe 66 but about 20 years. So there were three times a devaluation in 1950, 59, and 65. So I will not elaborate this, but uh, because I'm only introdu introducing here. So later you can click on the link and see this. Yeah? During Suharto, five times devaluation. Yeah? Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, that was the leader, yeah? The president, and this is the uh, finance minister, Menkeu, and gubernur, governor, yeah? Uh, so, divided into from 1945 to 1966 in Sukarno's time, from 1966 to 2001 in Suharto's time, and plus a bit more time, yeah? Two, three years after that, and, uh, <coughs> Uh, here is uh, from from 2001 until now. Uh, SME number 30 is Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Basically, you can see that Indonesia's currency has always undergone a devaluation uh, uh, from its founding. And here about uh, the president, yeah? This is in 2015, so it's a bit outdated, but it's good information. Uh, on why he thinks that uh, the rupiah is devaluated and uh, the reason uh, 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 
uh, who who is uh, to to blame perhaps uh, for example here he states that uh, president jokowi is still thinking conventionally and is still under the influence of the united states uh, the indonesian people however are fed up with uh, the weakness of the uh, indonesian diplomacy which has sold indonesian cheaply to the united states without uh, give and take an equal give and take so this is in 2015 i'm sure he has changed his mind now 2020 because a lot of things has uh, 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 has changed yeah and this is one of his latest articles 17 may 2020 yeah whether the finance minister and the uh, central bank governor whether they are having a duet or a duel and uh, this is going to be interesting but i'm going to share later during the question and answer session yeah uh, okay and this is uh, okay so uh i think that's it from me i'm just going to do that i have more slides but i'm going to present it later uh perhaps uh it is as uh perhaps uh i think the order of the presentation uh do you want to present first, Prof, or Prof uh, uh, Pak Sohibul, Prof Fadel? Let me, let me guess. Perhaps Prof Fadel, you can present first. You can just uh, say uh, uh, on the topic, uh, on your topic, how to achieve uh, monetary sovereignty for post-colonial countries. Or we can have it more informally, question and answer and all that between you and us uh, and the audience here. It's up to you, yeah. Um, I'm happy to start with some opening remarks and uh, and then have uh, our friend Suhibul uh, intervene as well, and then we have a conversation. Um, so uh, thank you again for, for hosting this webinar series on uh, economic and monetary sovereignty and the job guarantee. So looking forward to uh, uh, listening to uh, the other uh, webinars in the next few days. So the, the approach that we're taking here, as you've introduced, is MMT or modern monetary theory. And one of the things I'd like to highlight in the beginning is uh, the, uh, the idea that modern monetary theory is, is an analytical lens that allows us to sort of shine a bright light on the economic system and discover or uncover the mechanics of how it functions. And once you shine that bright light on the mechanics of the system, you can start to identify areas of deficiencies. You can start identify areas where you can make adjustments to achieve better outcomes, uh, sustainability, full employment, price stability, um, you know, more sustainable prosperity, which is the, the ultimate goal. So the, the concept of monetary sovereignty uh, is something that's been, um, you know, highly debated in, in the literature in, in, recent, um, in recent months, uh, I suppose, especially on social media, um, in terms of what MMT means by monetary sovereignty. So there is this idea that the United States has monetary sovereignty because it's the, you know, the, the U.S. dollar is the, the most dominant currency, it's the reserve currency, and as a result, all the MMT policy ideas only apply to the US, um, which is not true. So MMT is saying there is a spectrum of monetary sovereignty. Different countries have different degrees of monetary sovereignty. The US does have a very high degree of monetary sovereignty, but it's not the only country. Uh, countries like the, you know, Canada, the UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, and, and so on, uh, Japan uh, have very high degrees of monetary sovereignty, which allows the government a much, much more spending capacity. So uh, to, to begin the discussion here, let's think of what the mainstream analysis of, um, of fiscal spending capacity is and compare that to MMT. Uh, and I'll, I'll use you know, my, my fingers here to, to show you the, the fiscal policy space, you know, symbolically at least. So mainstream uh, economic theory and economic policy tells us that the spending capacity or the fiscal policy space that a government has is limited by tax revenues and borrowing capacity. Um, so it's, it's there, but it's limited. 
MMT says that tax in, in borrowing capacity is not the real limit. It turns out that for most countries, especially for countries with high degrees of monetary sovereignty, the fiscal policy space is much larger. It's not unlimited, it's not infinite, but it's limited by the risk of inflation. So the risk of inflation from an MMT perspective is determined by two key areas. One is the productive capacity. When we run out of productive capacity, meaning machinery, equipment, technology, skilled workers, raw materials, then we hit the productive capacity limit and that leads to inflation. Prices start to go up once you have shortages. The second source of inflation, which is very important, is, has to do with market power. So if you have within your economy key players, um, monopolies, oligopolies, powerful you know, business interests, um, in some cases corrupt business interests, when you have those entities, they can raise prices because they can or because we let them. So in other words, if you make those industries more competitive, if you democratize those industries, you can actually increase your fiscal policy space because you weaken their capacity to administer prices, to raise prices and to, and to cause inflation. So uh, that's the first kind of bright light that we shine on the system, that there is additional spending capacity beyond what we normally think of. Um, so now on the productive capacity side, the good news is that you can actually build more productive capacity. You can invest in education, technical training, build more technological capabilities, more infrastructure, which allows you to increase the spending limit. So this means you have to have an industrial policy. You have to have an agricultural policy. You have to have you know, strategies to actually target the areas where you would potentially hit your maximum productive capacity. So you do that over time. So MMT never says you know, spend and then when the inflation materializes, we'll deal with it later. That's not true. MMT always says before you even start the spending, you start to identify the potential risks of inflation and you target those strategically with spending that increases productive capacity and with taxing and regulating the market power of key players in those industries so that you don't hit that risk of inflation uh, limitation. So now back to the idea of the spectrum of monetary sovereignty. Monetary sovereignty doesn't, it's not something that you legislate. The, the government doesn't just declare, okay, starting tomorrow, we're going to have monetary sovereignty and we're going to float the exchange rate and we're going to, you know, um, you know, cancel all the external debt. That's not, that's not how it works. Well, you could cancel all the external debt or default on the external debt, uh, but that's not always the, you know, the, the most successful strategy. You have to have a plan if you go in to say, we're not going to pay the external debt. Um, if you're going to float the exchange rate, you're going to have to have a plan before you do that. Otherwise, you're going to face the consequences of, you know, geopolitical and economic isolation uh, and retaliation from financial markets and so on. So how do you, as a country, uh, build an economic strategy that can get you to a point where you can truly have that level of economic independence, where you can float your exchange rate, where you can default on external debt, where you can negotiate based on your own terms, where you can be selective in terms of which kinds of foreign direct investment you're going to allow in your country. And you can do that without having to suffer the consequences of any external retaliation. Even if it mean, means an external shock to your exchange rate, you can have resilience to withstand those external pressures. So the process of kind of using the MMT lens to get to that point is really the most interesting thing to me. And I think that's the part that many of our uh, colleagues and friends who are critics of the MMT perspective uh, often neglect the process of getting there. So uh, first step is building that resilience and moving to a higher degree of monetary sovereignty. So number one, MMT never says you should float your exchange rate and everything will be fine. Because this is what happens for most developing countries when you float your exchange rate and, and not have the resilience and not have a plan to, to deal with it. You float your exchange rate, 
and you're dependent on food imports or energy imports or medical equipment imports or any basic necessities that you import, once you float your exchange rate and you happen to have a trade deficit, you happen to have any kind of external pressure on your exchange rate, you start facing serious inflation pass-through effect, meaning everything you import from the rest of the world all of a sudden is more expensive. So that translates into you know, potentially social instability, political instability, food riots, you know, energy riots, and so on. So that MMT is, is not advocating just floating the exchange rate and nothing will, will happen. So how do you get to a point where you can actually float your exchange rate without having to worry about food imports inflation or energy imports inflation? Well, the key is to go to the root causes of the sources of inflation in your country. And these vary from country to country, but in most developing countries, the sources of inflation pressure points happen to um, uh, be uh, related to food imports. Uh, so the solution is to invest in sustainable agriculture, to build levels of self-sufficiency so you can get to a point where a devaluation of the exchange rate or depreciation of the exchange rate wouldn't cause food riots the next day because you have the basic food necessities in your domestic economy. The second source of potential inflation is energy, imports of energy, especially imports of fossil fuels. So to get to the point where you can float your exchange rate and claim more economic sovereignty without having to face the consequences of uh, currency depreciation is getting to a level of energy sovereignty where you can produce your energy domestically for transportation, for heating and cooling and, and so on. Uh, and that means investing in renewable um, energy production systems and energy storage systems domestically. Uh, otherwise, you're constantly depending on oil prices, which you can't control. Um, and the third source of um, economic deficiency that most developing countries uh, struggle with is a mismatch between the value added content of what they export and the value added content of what they import. So if you're ex exporting low value added content and importing high value added content, you're always gonna be in that trap. Uh, so how do you move your industrial machinery, industrial infrastructure to producing high value added content? The only way to do it is by investing in research and development, education, infrastructure, technical training, so that you can move your productive capacity to higher levels of value added production, so that you become more selective when you're bringing in foreign direct investment, so that you move away from uh, an industrial policy that's focused on assembly line type of jobs. In other words, imports all the capital and all the intermediate goods and focuses on using, and using uh, low skilled, you know, um, uh, subsidized labor in, in many cases uh, to, to assemble product for, for exports. Uh, so these are generally the three areas where you have you know, uh, serious deficiencies that force developing countries into that trap. Um, so notice, you know, the focus on inflation is extremely important here. And the last thing I want to say, and maybe then open up the conversation uh, after that, is the mainstream approach to inflation is, um, is essentially useless when it comes to helping developing countries deal with inflation. So let's take a, an example. If, if a country is dealing with inflation risks, that are related to energy imports and food imports, for example. And let's say the food import source of inflation is imports of wheat. Um, I, I, I focus on, on this in particular because many countries in the Middle East and North Africa in particular, a, a huge portion of, of imports and food imports are wheat imports because that's the basic staple for uh, North African uh, food and cuisine uh, and, and oil imports, fossil fuel imports. Those two commodities are controlled essentially by a group of countries. In the case of energy, it's OPEC. Uh, in the case of wheat, it's, you know, who are the big producers of wheat? It's the, uh, you know, the countries that 
you know, Tunisia imports from, for example, will be Russia, the Ukraine, Australia, and so on. So when the Central Bank of Tunisia says that we're targeting inflation, they mean targeting inflation in the textbook sense of the term, which means we're going to raise interest rates to lower, um, to lower inflation. Now, how is raising the interest rate in Tunisia going to convince OPEC to reduce oil prices? How is raising the interest rate in Tunisia going to, reduce the, going to convince the Ukraine or Russia or Australia to reduce global wheat prices? It has nothing to do with it. So the Central Bank of Tunisia could be raising interest rate all at once. And at the same time, acceleration of inflation is happening because of global conditions, because of market power of key players who are raising global energy prices and global food prices. So in other words, the central bank is completely powerless in managing the risk of inflation or taming inflation in that particular case. Instead, which entity in Tunisia actually has the power to manage that inflation? It's not the central bank. Instead, it's the Ministry of Agriculture. If it puts in place an agricultural policy to insulate the food price system domestically from fluctuations in prices by the Ukraine and Russia and, and, and so on. So that's how you build resilience. So you get to a point where you don't actually care what those powerful entities are doing externally. The same is true for energy prices. If you develop a domestic food sovereignty and energy sovereignty system, then you don't really care what you know, conflicts happen in the Middle East, what conflicts happen between you know, the Russians and the Saudis on oil prices, because your economy is now insulated and protected from those price fluctuations because you're self-sufficient, or at least close to being self-sufficient. So building that level of, level of resiliency allows you to be in control of your own economic destiny. In other words, you're not going to have to sacrifice your quality of life and your people's quality of life in order to defend the exchange rate, in order to stabilize prices based on external pressures. So MMT is essentially saying build that level of resilience. MMT shines the light on those weaknesses and says, focus on building resilience in those areas. And when you do that, not only will you acquire more economic sovereignty, but you acquire more monetary sovereignty. At that point, you can float your exchange rate and you can design your own independent economic policy based on your own needs, as opposed to based on whatever the external you know, players allow you to do. And when I say allow you to do, I, I mean that specifically because if you're facing a currency crisis and the IMF comes in as a lender of last resort to help you, or whoever is lending you money says, well, we're gonna save you during this crisis, but you're gonna have to do X, Y, Z. And that X, Y, Z includes reducing uh, budget spending on education or reducing budget spending on health or forcing the government to impose higher fees and, and higher costs um, and privatizing education and health and infrastructure and so on. That's when you lose your economic independence. So building resilience means you don't need to count on somebody coming to save your economy and dictate how you manage your own priorities. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, there's lots of other uh, related topics, obviously, but we'll, we'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Prof. Fadil. You make it sound so easy, uh, such that we are wondering, why is it so difficult for these post-colonial countries in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in Asia, in uh, Latin America or South America, in the Caribbean, uh, basically all over the world, why is it so difficult then if it's so clear and easy what is to be done so let's see one moment, pa. One moment go ahead yeah. no pa Sohibu. okay let's see what pa Sohibu has to say about the indonesian case first and i have something to add also on that so pa Sohibu, yeah uh it's your turn now uh, i think he was the Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, most of our participants is 
uh, orang Indonesia. Uh, so let me express in Indonesia and may may Mr. Surya help me to translate it into English. Saya lihat ada peserta selain Pak Fadil Kabup, ada dari Filipina, ada dari mana-mana. Uh, translate my presentation into English. Saya berterima kasih sekali dengan paparan Pak Fadil Kabup dan itu membuat kita lebih cerah memahami uh, kedaulatan moneter tidak serupa mitos tetapi sesuatu yang agak uh, terhijab dari kita di berbagai negara. So let me translate. Thank you very much for all our participants from uh, even though a lot of our participants are Indonesians, we have uh, participants from outside of Indonesia such as the Philippines and uh, other places. Uh, I hope uh, later uh, we can discuss this issue freely because there's a lot of things uh, I have on my mind. Continue. Indonesia seperti negara-negara lain saat ini uh, menghadapi masalah yang sama wabah pandemi Pak Presiden dalam beberapa waktu yang lalu berpidato tentang bagaimana cara menggunakan musibah ini sebagai titik tolak loncat untuk tidak hanya sekedar recovery ekonomi tapi juga melakukan suatu perubahan yang besar ke depan. Bahan saya berikut ini akan mencoba membuat hal itu atau pemahaman Indonesia sebagai salah satu contoh tentang bagaimana sebetulnya uji coba atau cara menerapkan monetary sovereignty dan sumber-sumber keuangan untuk semua pembiayaan yang diperlukan untuk memajukan ekonomi Indonesia tidak terbatas pada skala ekonomi pemulihan bukan hanya ekonomi recovery saja. Uh, our president uh, has said that we must use this time of pandemic not only for recovery but also for resurgence. So how do we do that? So therefore, I think uh, the discussion of monetary sovereignty uh, is very important. And I'm going to present later to you some uh, empirical facts or some findings that we have on this uh, monetary sovereignty. Walaupun saya akan menggunakan bahan-bahan kebijakan negara, tapi saya tidak bisa memastikan akan sepandangan dengan pemerintah kita. Saya tahu persis ada banyak hal yang mempengaruhi pengambilan kebijakan atau keputusan di dalam rangka menghadapi pandemi dan recovery ekonomi di Indonesia. Di dalam negeri sendiri ada kontroversi di situ, bahkan ada kelompok-kelompok yang memiliki argumen yang kuat memajukan persoalan ini sebagai persoalan nasional yang serius bahkan lebih jauh melangkah mengajukan gugatan sesuai prosedur hukum Indonesia melalui Mahkamah Konstitusi menurut mereka ada hal-hal yang dilanggar secara substansial terutama soal peran penganggaran dan fungsi DPR kita lihat saja ke depan bagaimana hal itu akan terjadi dan memang saya pun tidak akan melakukan pembahasan cara itu. Akan lebih fokus kepada pemans keuangan dari pemerintah kita dalam menangani persoalan-persoalan kekinian. Dan saya akan menyarankan hal-hal yang saya anggap sangat relevan untuk uh, maksud memajukan ekonomi Indonesia ke depan. There are some uh, controversies in Indonesia itself about the Indonesian economy recovery stimulus uh, in which uh, some influential figures, uh, nationally influential figures, have even uh, uh, 
have even sued the government, sued the government, sued the government in constitutional court. Perhaps Pak Sohibul, you haven't known this. They have uh, retracted the suit. So Din Samsudin and Amin Rais, they have retracted the suit. Uh, and uh, I would not discuss that much further, but just note that there are lots of different opinions on the Indonesian economic recovery strategies, uh, amount of uh, stimulus, and all, all, all aspects of it, basically. Continue. Uh, stimulus untuk COVID-19 dalam APBN 2020, 2020 kita lihat uh, dalam gambar ini nggak bisa diperlebar sur ya uh, pada tanggal 1 April uh, dukungan stimulus itu berjumlah 405,1 triliun yang terbagi dalam beberapa alokasi industri uh, ekonomi dan lain sebagainya hanya dalam waktu tidak cukup uh, satu bulan ini pada tanggal 18 Mei 2020 membengkak lagi menjadi 641,17 triliun dengan tiga alokasi yang sama. Lalu 4 Juni 2020 bengkak lagi menjadi 677,2 triliun. Dan terakhir 17 Juni 2020 menjadi 695,2 triliun. Kalau saya ditanya masih diperlukankah pembengkakan lagi? Masih. Berapa berapa unlimited bergantung kepada kemauan dan perencanaan kita yang sedetil-detilnya untuk keluar dari masalah ekonomi ini sesuai dengan uh, arahan Pak Presiden bahwa momentum ini sangat baik untuk dimanfaatkan untuk uh, melompat jauh dari masalah-masalah struktural yang kita hadapi dalam ekonomi kita uh, selama ini. Kita tahu bahwa masalah ekonomi itu uh, memiliki Uh, sumbangan dari berbagai uh, faktor, faktor hubungan internasional, faktor uh, kendala dalam negeri seperti sejarah politik dan lain sebagainya. Uh, so we can see here that the stimulus uh, amount has increased rapidly within the last few months. Few months, even within the space of one and a half month, the stimulus amount has increased from 400 trillion around 400 trillion to see around 650 trillion and within less than one month or three weeks it or even two weeks it has further increased to 677 trillion and another two weeks or less than two weeks it has increased into close to 700 trillion trillion so if I was asked how much more money do we need, I would say unlimited. It depends on our understanding actually of uh, monetary sovereignty, monetary theory, and it depends on the political will of the government to really uh, uh, provide a proper amount of stimulus uh, to the Indonesian uh, citizens. Uh, I will translate a bit this to dollars Yeah, I think uh, $1 trillion is about uh 100 million uh, sorry 1 trillion rupiah is about 100 million or 10 million i'm sorry 10 million uh, uh no 100 million uh, uh dollars i think uh currency, currency. i'll check it later but basically uh one rupiah is equal to uh, sorry one dollars is one dollar is equal to about fifteen thousand rupiah I will check it on my phone later how much are this amount but this is very little uh, in dollar amounts yeah uh, compared to the stimulus of the US for example next uh, kalau kita lihat pembagian dari biaya penanganan COVID-19 Indonesia dilihat dari berbagai alokasinya itu korporasi 
53,37 triliun. Iya. Catat ini 53,37 triliun. Nanti akan ada diskusi yang serius mengenai itu. Kemudian sektoral Pemda 100,6 eh 106,11 triliun. Kesehatan 85,77 triliun. Perlindungan sosial 203,9 triliun. Insentif usaha 120,61 triliun. UMKM 123,46 triliun. Memang tidak tergambarkan secara jelas di sini detil-detil yang menggambarkan demokratisasi dari masalah-masalah penanganan ini. Memang kelihatannya UMKM ada 123,46 triliun. Tetapi UMKM ini tidaklah automatically bisa diterjemahkan langsung ke sasaran yang bisa membangkitkan rakyat kita. Rakyat kita sekarang itu, apalagi mereka yang berada pada sektor informal, uh, tidak beroleh sesuatu yang betul-betul uh, mendasar, yang bisa mempertahankan uh, ketahanan mereka dalam menjalani hidup. Betul bahwa uh, sesuai data yang kita kumpul beberapa waktu bahwa informal sektor adalah satu pengaman yang kuat. Terbukti uh, berulang kali krisis yang begitu dahsyat sektor informal itu dinyatakan sebagai uh, faktor yang begitu kuat menopang ekonomi Indonesia sehingga tidak uh, kolaps. Di sini persoalannya adalah alokasi yang kurang lebih dari 695 triliun itu seberapa persen sasaran langsung ke tangan rakyat. So we can see here uh, in color uh, in uh, uh, the allocation of stimulus for each sectors uh, in Indonesia. So we have uh, the health sector uh, getting about 86 trillion rupiah and social protection for all Indonesian citizens about 204 trillion rupiah and this is uh, small and medium businesses about 124 trillion rupiah so even though we can see that uh, the uh, small and medium businesses the informal sector are getting uh, one seventh uh, about more than one seven a little bit more than one seventh of the stimulus we don't know uh, the effectiveness of the stimulus as we know in indonesia we have lots of informal sector about 90 percent and they have proven really to be the backbone of the indonesian people during times of economic crisis and we see here also corporation uh, gets about 54 trillion rupiah uh, and uh, the business world or the business sector gets about 121 trillion rupiah. So we can see that cooperation and the business sector gets more than the small and medium uh, businesses. Masih di sini. Uh, kembali ke atas. atas. Kita lihat sektor Pemda 106,11 uh, triliun. Banyak orang menyebut saya itu jumlah yang amat besar. Tapi saya merasa sebaliknya, itu amat terlalu kecil. Kita tahu rakyat kita bukan di Jakarta. Jakarta hanya satu di antara sekian provinsi. Kabupaten kota rakyat kita bertabur di desa-desa di sejumlah kabupaten kota di 500 sekian kabupaten. Nah, 106,11 triliun itu bagi saya sangat tidak memadai, bahkan seyugianya jumlah terbesar harus dialokasikan ke daerah-daerah. Katakanlah misalkan setiap kabupaten kota di stimulus uh, 5 triliun, katakanlah angka itu dulu 5 triliun, provinsi 7 sampai 10 triliun, untuk bisa memberi kesempatan bagi pemerintah daerah 
yang di sanalah rakyat banyak bergayut untuk bisa melakukan berbagai tindakan-tindakan penyelamatan secara ekonomi kepada rakyat. Karena kalaupun ada stimulus untuk sektor UMKM yang 123,46 triliun dan pembiayaan korporasi itu belum tentu uh, memiliki disinggung dengan uh, tingkat atau taraf kehidupan masyarakat. Karena itu saya ingin mengulangi bahwa alokasi ini sangat minimum dan tidak memuaskan bagi saya dilihat dari bagaimana seharusnya kita memberi jawaban kepada masyarakat yang tersebar di 500-an kabupaten kota di desa-desa yang terisolasi dan sangat sulit mendapatkan akses ekonomi. Silakan. This is very important. The green sector above for uh, regional or and local governments. Uh, they are allocated very little uh, compared to the need, their need, uh, only 106 uh, trillion, which is 17, exactly 17. Uh, Pak Sohibul is proposing that this amount uh, given to the uh, regional and local governments be enlarged, much more enlarged, perhaps one city or regency uh, obtaining uh, about 5 billion, uh, 5 trillion, uh, rupiah and one province obtaining uh, 10 trillion uh, rupiah because a lot of the majority of the population of Indonesia they are located uh, in the uh, regions and in the uh, uh, cities and uh, in the provinces even in Java uh, a lot more are uh, living outside of Jakarta uh, greater Jakarta area for example, in East Java, in Central Java, in West Java. So this is really important that he wants to emphasize on it. Lalu kemudian, kalau kita melihat ke belakang, uh, keluhan Pak Presiden Jokowi, jumlah alokasi yang sudah ditetapkan kepada berbagai sektor dalam rangka stimulus ekonomi, uh, stimulus, uh, apa ini, uh, COVID ini, Daya seratnya sangat rendah. Ini big problem. Jadi kalau tetap fokus di Jakarta, itu akan mengalami masalah. Sementara hari demi hari, Indonesia mengalami pertambahan penderitaan rakyat. Karena dalam menangani masalah-masalah pandemi itu dari aspek perlindungannya maupun pemulihan pasien-pasien itu dan pencegahan persebaran ke berbagai wilayah kita termasuk agak lambat di beberapa negara misalkan Malaysia, Singapura, juga Filipina dan Thailand karena itu keluhan Pak Jokowi bagi saya sangat serius dan itu sekaligus mestinya harus disikapi dengan uh, refocusing atau merombak tidak memfokuskan alokasi itu di pemerintah pusat tetapi uh, ke daerah-daerah agar sesegera mungkin penyelamatan rakyat bisa dilakukan inilah data terbaru tentang uh, daya serap uh, anggaran yang sudah dialokasikan itu tetap juga tidak begitu mengembirakan Sekali, sekali lagi pesan saya adalah bagaimana untuk lebih memfokuskan kepada daerah-daerah. Saya tadi menyebut uh, satu angka, 5 triliun untuk kabupaten kota, 10 triliun untuk provinsi. Jangan-jangan ada daerah yang uh, menurut keluasan wilayah dan jumlah penduduk serta tingkat kemiskinan dan tingkat keparahan penderitaannya malah diperlukan jumlah yang lebih besar dari itu. Reflecting back on the anger uh, that were showcased on television by the president on how the large amount of stimulus uh, has not actually been disbursed to the uh, people uh, who requires it. So here we have data on how much uh, of the stimulus has been disbursed. Uh, and still we can see that 
not much or not all of it uh, has been dispersed. Uh, this is 5 August, a uh, few weeks back, or the first week of August. We can see uh, very little, yeah, from 87.5 trillion, only 6.8 trillion, not even 10% uh, uh, of health uh, stimulus or health funding was disbursed. Uh, the same uh, with other uh, uh, sectors. And this is the latest data today. Uh, we can see here for, for the uh, family program about 71 percent for the, uh, the um, staples, staples, food staples, yeah, or necessary staples, daily necessities about uh, 60 percent uh, for uh, social assistance, cash and non-cash about 62 percent uh, and for village fund about 30 percent. In essence, none of them has reached 100%, even though uh, a lot, uh, I would say a lot, a lot of deaths. People have died because they are hungry, they are sick, they are ill, and they have complained by demonstrating on the streets, by walking uh, tens and even hundreds of kilometers to the city center uh, to protest about this stimulus. So again, Pak Soibul is emphasizing the need the necessity to give a larger, much larger allocation to regional and local governments because they are the ones who know more, who are closer to the Indonesian citizens in their respective allocations. Alasan saya untuk mengajukan itu adalah kalau kita kembali ke konstitusi kita, terutama pada pembukaan Undang-Undang Dasar 1945, melindungi segenap bangsa dan seluruh tumpah darah. Jadi negeri ini didirikan untuk uh, misi melindungi segenap bangsa dan seluruh tumpah darah, memajukan setelah umum, mencerdaskan kehidupan bangsa. Hal yang berikutnya adalah menghapuskan penjajahan dan juga ikut uh, menetipkan uh, dunia supaya lebih adil. Berikutnya adalah mengenai sumber-sumber pembiayaan. Selalu orang bertanya kepada saya bahwa kalau Anda ingin melakukan alokasi sebesar itu, sebetulnya uang kita dari mana? Ini persoalan yang selalu dikemukakan pada kita. Kalau kita melihat apa yang dilakukan oleh pemerintah, ada skema burden sharing. Di kolom ketiga, yang paling sebelah kanan, itu ditanggung seluruhnya oleh BI melalui pembelian surat berharga negara, SBN. Dengan mekanisme private placement dengan tingkat kupon sebesar BI Reserve Repo Rate, di mana BI akan mengembalikan bunga atau imbalan yang diterima kepada pemerintah secara penuh. Lalu, ditanggung oleh pemerintah melalui penjualan SBN kepada market dan BI berkonsentrasi sebesar selisih bunga pasar market rate dengan BI reserve repo rate tiga bulan dikurangi satu uh, persen dan yang terakhir adalah ditanggung pemerintah seluruhnya sebesar market rate jadi ada peluang untuk melakukan itu dengan uh, strategi ini toh sudah dicontohkan Cuma saya meminta jumlah yang lebih besar dari itu. So we can see here the sources of uh, Indonesian stimulus funding in which the first part actually is the most innovative one. Uh, the Indonesian government and central bank has called this burden sharing. This is just specifically Indonesian term. So they classify it into two, public goods and non-public goods. So for public goods is ditanggung uh, seluruhnya uh, or is the burden, the entire burden. That's the translation, literal translation. Yeah, The entire burden or is paid for by the central bank. We, uh, effectively, the entire uh, paragraph means that the central bank is funding about uh, 
400 trillion rupiah, more than half yeah, of the stimulus, 87 plus 203 plus 106, or around, around half, or yeah, more than half of the stimulus uh, with uh, effectively a zero interest rate. So the central bank the, are buying the uh, government debt, uh, government obligation, government bond, uh, effectively at a zero rate, even if uh, they, they are buying it with a reverse repo rate, whatever it is, but the interest that they get would be returned to the government fully. So effectively, it's a zero interest rate. And we can see non-public goods are divided into two, in which for the first one, uh, for corporation and small and medium businesses funding, uh, it is paid for by the government through, again, uh, government debt, bond or obligation, uh, which is sold to the market and to the central bank, with the central bank contributing uh, the difference between market rate interest rate and central bank repos, repo rate of three months, minus 1%. So this is just some details here. Yeah? So you can see that the central bank has actual, also actually been very innovative, but it wasn't achieved easily. Uh, uh, as Cristanto Bisono, this is my commentary, yeah, said earlier, uh, there was actually some duet, uh, duel first, and then duet between the finance minister and the central bank governor before this burden sharing agreement is reached. Last but not least, 328 point Eight seven trillion uh, is paid for by the government, of course, also by the bond debt or obligation, yeah, uh, uh, with market interest rate. Ya, ini uh, penjelasan lebih lanjut pada sharing pemerintah dan Bank Indonesia menurut Menteri Keuangan dalam rakyat Komisi 11 DPR RI tanggal 29 Juni tahun 2020. Bukan dah? 29 Juni 2020. Hmm? Ya. Ini adalah paparan tentang defisit dalam uh, triliun pendapatan negara yang terdiri dari perpajakan PNB belanja negara kemudian divisinya 10% dan pembiayaan anggaran uh, menurut Perpres 54 tahun 2010 angka-angkanya tersebar di situ dan menurut Perpres 22 tahun 2010 angkanya ada di, di sebelah kanan We can see here the burden sharing has caused Indonesian deficit to increase. Previously, uh, the Indonesian uh, regulation only allows 3% deficit as per the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, it was increased to 5.07% uh, by the presidential uh, regulation uh, number 54 and then to 6.34% uh, by, uh, by the presidential regulation number 72. So we can see that they continue to increase the deficit. And the question is why uh, stop uh, here? Angka-angka tadi, bubur-bubur tadi, bagi saya menunjukkan sebuah dinamika yang ya kurang lebih menunjukkan kreativitas pemerintah. Ini defisit fiskal ya, diukur dari persentase menurut PDB akibat penanganan COVID-19. Kita perbandingkan di berbagai negara di dunia. Uh, kalau melihat persebaran negara-negara ini, mungkin ada yang menganggap, oh enggak apple to apple. Tapi cobalah kita buat dulu sebagai perbandingan. Di Kanada, defisit fiskalnya itu 21 persen. Itali, 
negeri sepak bola itu 21%. Amerika Serikat tempat tinggal Fadil Gabuk 20%, tinggi sekali. Dan Prancis 17%, Singapura 15,4%, Jepang 15%, Inggris 9%, dan Indonesia terkecil 6,34%. Di sini ada teman kita dari Filipina, nanti bisa memberikan pendapat tentang berapa presentasi di visit berdasarkan PDB di negara beliau. Artinya, ada outlook cara pandang yang berbeda dari dulu-dulu uh, ketika kita menghadapi uh, wabah pandemi yang sekarang sedang kita tangani bersama dan mengglobal itu. Kemudian, di Amerika ini penjelasan aja saya kira, ya ada Amerika penjelasan mengenai Amerika di sini, kemudian Australia, India, Tiongkok. Saya berharap data-data ini bisa memberikan kita data perbandingan bagaimana berbagai negara di dunia melakukan kebijakan moneter dan fiskalnya dalam kaitan untuk menghadapi pandemi dan itu mencerminkan bagaimana tingkat kemandirian fiskal mereka. So we can see here in comparison to other countries, Indonesian deficit. Even though these countries are not cannot be compared apple to apple, as the saying goes, but just for quick comparison, we can see that Indonesia actually the deficit, the fiscal deficit, is still relative low. Whereas we can see here for the United States on the right side, it is stated that practically they have unlimited uh, quantitative easing. Yeah, the, the term here used here. So uh, this makes us wonder why the difference in uh, the ability uh, uh, to have deficit. Uh, this perhaps reflects the degree of monetary sovereignty had by their respective countries, or maybe, or it may not. We'll see later, yeah? Uh, Pak Solibur also hopes that other people from other countries who are viewing this webinar can share with us the experience of their own uh, uh, countries later, such as our friends from the Philippines. Okay. Monetary sovereignty. Uh, ini kita akan membahas soal uh, kedaulatan moneter kita. Sesuara, sebetulnya ini istilah umum, tapi Mungkin karena kita orang teknik, orang uh, sejarah hampir tidak memberi perhatian. Tapi ini uh, semacam uh, gambaran umum. Dolatan keuangan itu uh, paling tidak terdapat beberapa karakteristiknya. Di sini saya berikan uh, empat di antara sekian banyak itu. Yang paling umum, yang paling prinsipal. Pertama, menciptakan mata uang sendiri. Apakah itu dilakukan? Di satu negara, apa tidak? Tentu ya, untuk Indonesia. Dan apa mata uangmu, saudara? Ah, rupiah di sini. Yang kedua, memajaki dalam mata uang sendiri kah? Atau tidak? Tentu kita ya di sini dengan rupiah. Yang ketiga, meminjam dalam mata uang sendiri kah kita? Ya, kalau menurut data, ada perbedaan dari rumus ini. Kalau sini rumus idealnya menurut saya 60% dari total pinjaman kita harusnya dalam bentuk rupiah. Dan kalaupun meminjam dengan mata uang lain, dolar, yen, dan lain sebagainya itu, mestinya jumlahnya berproporsi lebih kecil dari jumlah dalam mata uang sendiri. Ini untuk mengantisipasi risiko-risiko fluktuasi currency yang bisa tiba-tiba membuat kita rontok dalam permen pasar uang. Dan tempat yang terakhir adalah membebaskan nilai tukar mata uang. Mambang ya, saya. Dan walaupun begitu, tetap saja ada faktor-faktor yang harus dihitung. Dan uh, itu seluruhnya akan membuat kita sedikit agak lebih spesifik untuk menghadapi nilai tukar mata uang itu. 
Prinsipnya iya, tetapi ada kondisi tertentu sehingga kita tergantung pada kondisi itu. So these are the four, uh, uh, let's say checklist that uh, uh, we can we can see we can use to see whether a country has uh, monetary sovereignty. For Indonesia, does it create its own currency? Yes, uh, rupiah. Does it tax in its own currency? Yes, in rupiah. Does it borrow in its own currency? Unfortunately, yes, but uh, only 60% of the borrowing and the rest, 40%, is in foreign uh, denominated debt, yeah? In dollars, in yen, and others. Later, we can see the statistics. Do we have a floating exchange rate in Indonesia? Yes, but depending on the condition, the central bank uh, may intervene, as they have done this year, uh, perhaps one or two or more, but quite a few times, yeah? Susah, seperti susah lihat, tidaklah begitu rumit, apapun disiplin kita, bisa mudah, mudah memahami itu. Iya, data-data yang terkait dengan uh, yang kita tadi. Tahun 2016, ini yang tanya, ayo kita lihat sebelah kiri, tabel apa, sebelah kiri, gambar sebelah kiri itu, ada lima diagram pohon di situ. Tahun 2016, komposisinya 1 persen, 4 persen, 7 persen, 31 dan 57 persen itu komposisinya. Nah, komposisi apakah itu rupiah, US dollar, Jepang, euro, dan lainnya. Tahun 2017, naik 59 persen untuk rupiah ya. 29 persen, 6 persen, 4 persen, dan 1 persen. Fluktuasi ini menunjukkan bagaimana tingkat pengaruh kita dan bagaimana merespon terhadap itu. Tahun 2020, nah saya ringkaskan aja, 60 persen, 28 persen, 6 persen, 5 persen, dan 1 persen. Tapi apa sebelah kanan, gambar sebelah kanan adalah uh, utang kita berdasarkan instrumen. Satu gambar terbawah itu berdasarkan SBN dan kemudian yang kedua lain. 79 persen, 81 tahun 2017, 80 persen tahun 2018, 2019 tahun uh, 84 persen dan tahun 2020 uh, 84 persen. Sekali lagi ini adalah gambaran tentang fluktuasi dan respon-respon yang diberikan oleh pemerintah kita dalam kaitan dengan uh, uh, utang dan penggunaan mata uang uh, sendiri atau mata uang asing dalam instrumen utang itu tadi. Terima kasih. So we can see here the more specific details on Indonesia's debt. Uh, about 60% of Indonesia's debt are denominated in its own currency, while 40% are denominated in foreign currency. US dollars dominated about 28% in 2020 with the rest. Japanese yen, second, 6%, and euro, and 1% other currency. And more and more uh, Indonesian debt are denominated in rupiah. In 2016, 79% uh, only, and in 2019 and 20, 84%. So this shows, uh, according to the, yeah, according, according to the principle of monetary sovereignty, this is a good uh, development. Sorry. Ya, ini kurang lebih sama ya, komposisi utang luar negeri Indonesia tahun 2019. Terus tanya, Sir. Sorry. Nah, ini juga sama, hanya disajikan dalam bentuk uh, grafik berbeda supaya lebih nyaman menikmati. Terus, Sir. Ya. Hari sekalian, tadi saya ingin mengutip uh, ucapan dari Pak, Pak Kabup. Uh, kedaulatan moneter itu sangat mementingkan pengembangan produktif kapasiti dan kemudian market power. Ya, kalau hanya sekedar ingin berdaulat, tapi tidak melakukan hal-hal yang struktural dalam negeri, dan kemudian membaca dengan uh, sangat cermat variabel internasional, kita akan mengalami pelebatan-pelebatan yang tidak sesuai. Data-data yang 
saya sampaikan di sini uh, bukanlah saya buat-buat dan kami siapkan itu dengan tim Surya ada di situ Afilia istrinya dan bisa dicek konfirmasi dari sumber-sumber pemerintah. Saya kira begitu dari saya. Terima kasih sekali lagi kepada uh, partisipan dan mohon masukan kepada semua. Apa yang kami maksudkan dari webinar ini adalah sesuatu untuk uh, menyebar apa yang kita anggap uh, perlu didiskusikan mengenai negara kita. Dan ini adalah yang pertama untuk uh, topik ini akan dilanjutkan sampai tiga atau empat kali dan mohon uh, semua teman-teman uh, setia untuk menanti uh, jadwal penayangan uh, diskusi berikutnya dan especially for Mr. Agil Kabup, terima kasih sekali untuk Anda. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, thank you very much uh, for all of you. The data that I presented, that Pak Soegu presented, was obtained from official government sources and he hopes that uh, they can be uh, used as a means to uh, for us to evaluate Indonesia's monetary sovereignty and uh, to find out ways for, for example to reduce foreign debt and to reduce import and uh, to gain more and more sovereignty thank you for the audience thank you for Fadil, and please remember that we have several more webinars uh, uh, on this topic, uh, economic recovery and resurgence, which we hope that all of you also participate later. Okay, so. All right. So that's it from uh, Pak Sahibul. Uh, Prof. Fadil, do you mind I continue a bit on my presentation before going to you? Because. Uh, yes, please go ahead. All right, so this is mine, yeah? Uh, this is continuing on the problems that have been highlighted by uh, Pak Sohibul, yeah? Uh, here, we can see that uh, one of the stumbling block, or why, or before that, there's a little bit of uh, good news here. Indonesia uh, has released its uh, 75 uh, independence uh, celebration currency, yeah. This is a new currency here, seventy-five thousand. Our founding uh, uh, fathers, two of them are male, Sukarno Hatta, and a variety of uh, uh, Indonesian people from all walks of life, all cultures, all ethnicities at the bottom. And so, the question then becomes, uh, as I asked earlier. Why is it so uh, difficult to realize monetary sovereignty, to implement job guarantee and basic income as per Indonesia's constitution? One of them lies in what are being taught in universities. Here, we have a course of the Indonesian economy, uh, which needs to be reinterpreted to MMT lens. So this is from the, let's say, uh, premier Indonesian university, yeah? Universitas Indonesia. Uh, taught by the finance minister him, herself, and uh, this is former, uh, I think, finance or economics minister. There are the very important people, or all, all of this. And this uh, university, the, their graduates actually dominates the Indonesian uh, finance ministry. Yeah, so we can see here a very long process. Yeah, historical uh, economic history here covered in the beginning, uh, history of Indonesian economy, and all the way uh, to uh, sectoral uh, balances also, are also actually covered here, uh, though not from the MMT, MMT lens, yeah? And yeah, the finance minister herself came to give lectures at this university when she is required, yeah? And the last one is about, uh, let's see, uh, a summary, but before the summary is uh, about the small and medium uh, enterprise policy uh, from uh, Indonesia. So I think this course, uh, we need to recreate or reinterpret uh, this course, yeah? Indonesian economy through an MMT lens. So this is one problem because I wouldn't say that perhaps in the past that this uh, faculty, this university, this study program has produced quote unquote neoliberal economists in Indonesia, but, but in this time of pandemic, they seem to have a rethink 
and therefore Indonesia leads the world in terms of innovative monetary financing, but not further. And we wonder why. Yeah, I think they are held back by their whole understanding. Then, this is my uh, interpretation. Yeah, on uh, once we can see clearly through an MMT lens. What else is required towards implementing MMT recommended policies such as permanent zero interest rate policy and job guarantee? So I divided into two, yeah, domestic and foreign uh, stumbling block, yeah, or requirements. So for domestic requirements, uh, here, uh, of course, we need to enlighten uh, people, the people as we are doing through this webinar, and we need to educate religious and civil society leaders they are very important, religious leaders in Indonesia. They're the ones uh, who shape the opinions of the masses. And we need to advise all the branches of government. And if all these are not possible, or if all this becomes even, in, even more possible, we can acquire power through electoral politics. Uh, this is the last, yeah, which is last resort. So we can have two uh, perspectives with uh, foreign uh, countries, yeah conflict or uh, cooperation. So Indonesia actually, like the United States, like the French, had a revolution as stated by Anthony Reid in his book, yeah, Indonesian Revolution. So what prevented the success of Indonesian Revolution, which is one of the largest revolution, Indonesia has the largest uh, communist party outside of, uh, in fact, the largest maybe even, 30 million members, yeah? Uh, so what prevented their success, or the left, or the socialist, or the Muslim, uh, the, or the Islamist. The Islamist was also uh, prevented from uh, achieving the Indonesian revolution as uh, mandated by the Indonesian constitution. So there were external and internal reasons, but to my mind, uh, uh, more uh, the reasons are more external. Uh, foreign inter intervention throughout Indonesian history, and uh, we have a more worrying, uh, uh, development, yeah, in which uh, experts are saying that uh, the uh, militarism of the U.S. and the Chinese in the Southeast Asian region, especially the Chinese, are increasing uh, uh, as year goes by, perhaps to protect their investment. So there's a conflict perspective. For the from the cooperation perspective, is we can see the U.S. as provider of global security and China as the provider of global infrastructure. Of course, uh, for example, the, the Chinese, even though they are uh, uh, having their Belt and Road Initiative policies, and I have a friend, Anas Jalil from Malaysia, who told me the implementation of these policies actually depends on the political savvy of each uh, respective governments. So Malaysia has been very successful in renegotiating with the Chinese on the kind of uh, agreements that they have, whereas Indonesia is clearly lacking much behind. So Malaysia, when they are uh, negotiating with the Chinese, they manage to increase their monetary sovereignty, uh, whereas Indonesia decreased because every equipment, even the manpower even, are brought over from China, not from Indonesia. So this uh, depressed the Indonesian construction sector. And uh, here you can see uh, the U.S. Uh, military bases, yeah? Uh, U.S. Uh, military funding, 720 billion. Intelligence funding, 57 billion. Indonesian entire 2020 state budget is only 200 billion. So com just uh, the military funding and intelligence funding, 777, a nice number, this dwarfs, yeah? So uh, I think some of the leaders, I we have a very senior uh, legislative uh, member who told us that when he was voicing uh, out his frustration with Freeport contract, Freeport is a gold mine in Papua between a US company and Indonesian government, he was actually told by all his friends, be careful, you might be assassinated. Uh, so therefore, uh, he held back from voicing out criticism. And you can see here articles, yeah, issue articles on how the military is even more dominating in the US. This is a very recent one by our friends also, Rotten Alliance of Liberals and Neocons uh, shaping for US foreign policy. 
And I'm only having US here, but Chinese, I think also similar, increasing more and more. So this is one thing to watch uh, when we are implementing our sovereignty. This is uh, military bases, yeah, all over uh, Indonesia, surrounding Indonesia, looks like. And here, from a corporation perspective, so we actually had uh, an economist, Indonesian economist, who cooperated with the US uh, elites, yeah, to reduce or to eliminate uh, government debt or state government debt on the left side, state electric company government debt by reporting uh, in the Wall Street Journal about US uh, companies, multinational practices, their corrupt practices in Indonesia. So these are several sources and he is also often published in Wall Street Journals. And with regards to foreign denominated debt, uh, he advised Indonesia to negotiate and renegotiate like he did in 2001 when he managed to reduce Indonesia's debt to German, I think, by as much as 600 to 800 million dollars. Conversion of the debt to uh, forest, uh, converse, forest, forest uh, conservation uh, program. So this is some articles. So that's it from me. And now we come to the question and answer session. Perhaps uh, our audience and even from Kabul uh, and others here yeah, we can share freely on this issue of monetary sovereignty. We know Prof. Kabul has said uh, why and how, and Pak Soibul has shared uh, on the development during the pandemic and also uh, Indonesian data, especially foreign debt. And I have shared on perhaps foreign uh, perspective, yeah? Either it's either conflict or cooperation. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you. I will leave it to the audience to share with us and even the speakers can share with us. Please, you can ask or comment or criticize in Indonesia and I will translate. Apakah ada yang ingin bertanya, berkomentar, atau mengkritik, saya akan menerjemahkan. Uh, silakan. Mungkin belum ada, perhaps not yet, perhaps Prof. Kabuk, you can comment on what we have presented uh, so far. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Soibul. I really enjoyed your, your presentation. Uh, so in, in the case of Indonesia, I think you've, you've pointed to the, you know, the fundamental issue that we're looking at here, which is the external <laughs> debt and the composition <laughs> of the external debt. Uh, and the sources of, of the external debt. And I think what the pandemic has revealed um, in, in the pandemic. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and to constantly worry about the deficit, constantly worry about the impact of uh, uh, the debt um, and and our analysis I think highlights um, a, a possible way out of this um, uh, of this um, self-imposed uh, restriction which is to identify the areas in the Indonesian economy where you can build more resilience without having to worry about inflation so for example one of the things that, um, uh, and, and I have no specific expertise in the case of Indonesia, so you tell me where, uh, w if this is the case. In many developing countries, uh, the um, uh, major source of pressure on the government when it comes to external debt comes from um, key uh, players who happen to be major importers, uh, in some cases, major exporters. So if you're, if you're an importer um, and you have a dominant market position in the Indonesian economy, for example, one of the things you worry about is the depreciation of the currency would weaken your position economically. Um, and vice versa, if you're an exporter uh, and you rely heavily on importing intermediate goods, then you worry about a depreciation because a depreciation means that everything you import is more expensive 
And if you're importing raw materials, if you're importing intermediate goods and technology, that means that your cost of doing business becomes higher. And now if your production is destined to foreign markets, now your exports are becoming less competitive. So you're losing business. So if, if your economy is heavily dependent on uh, international markets, you have, have uh, economy who are constantly worried about uh, currency um, fluctuations and impose restrictions using their power and influence on what the government can do domestically to respond to a crisis, a public health crisis or an economic crisis. So now government is limited in its, in its response because it worrying and exporting industries create a lot of jobs that have a lot of uh, market influence and pull influence. Um, so uh, should function uh, when you have a small group of individuals essentially hijacking the economy to serve their economic interests and you know throwing the rest of the population under the bus, especially the most vulnerable people in, in the economy. Uh, so that is another area of concern for many developing countries, and that, and that involves political corruption in some cases, uh, where a small group of unelected individuals, business uh, groups essentially, um, set the boundaries and the limit of what economic policy should be during a crisis. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Kabul. Uh, we have, uh, okay, let me stop the sharing first, yeah? Okay. All right. Uh, so we were, we are broadcasting from a cafe, which is supposed to close at uh, 10 p.m., but they're closing early. So we had a bit of transition just now. But never mind, uh, we can broadcast still from the street, yeah? So this is a uh, street style uh, of uh, a webinar. So uh, it's raining also here. So I'm waiting for the rain to stop a bit before continuing, yeah? And my wife is bringing an umbrella. Jadi, uh, kita tadi barusan uh, agak transisi. Kita ke mobil masoy. Masoy di mana? Okay. So, look. So I'm holding an umbrella here. <laughs> One woman, yeah. You're, uh, Surya, you're you're taking MMT to the streets. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> because it is unexpected that we have to move. Uh, uh, and usually, uh, this cafe closes at ten uh, daily. Yeah. Uh, they used to close at eleven, but now now at ten. So I'm going to switch on the lights, okay, and uh, jadi jika ada pertanyaan dari kawan-kawan, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask, if you have any comments also, if you have anything to share, please do, otherwise I will, uh, uh, I will, I will uh, uh, ask questions uh, from our speakers. Please. Perhaps Pak Gulam, just now you share your screen. Dengar, hello. Hello. Ya, hello. Silakan, silakan. Ya, saya uh, mungkin hanya ingin. Indonesia juga memang semua negara ya saya rasa di era pandemi 19 ini semuanya apa ikut terimbas dan Indonesia yang kita rasakan memang terpuruk dari beberapa negara 
termasuk negara Singapura tetangga masih juga merupakan negara yang masih bagus lah. Jadi janganlah terlalu juga mudah-mudahan dengan era pandemi ini kita juga masih bisa bangkit dan ini adalah era untuk kita melompat lebih jauh. Saya rasa itu aja. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Gulam. Basically, he says that all countries are affected by the pandemic, and he hopes that Indonesia can make use of the development uh, that has happened because of the pandemic. Uh, so he's just giving his comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Anyone Excuse else? Me. Ada yang lagi? Okay. Who is that? Excuse me. Yes, who is that? Excuse me. Okay, Bukit Bukhari, please. Me? Okay, thank you. Can I speak English? I can speak English, yes, of course. Yeah. I want to address my question to Mr. Kabob. What's it? Mr. Fadel. Yes, please. Mr. Fadel, what do you think about Indonesian strategic Yes, good Bukhari. Do you think Indonesian government strategic to overcome pandemic in 2021 is a good uh, is a good strategic to overcome this pandemic while Indonesian government try to uh, recover our economy that's yes, thank you thank you well again i'll 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 start by saying that i'm i'm not an expert on the indonesian economy or the you know political economy of, of indonesia but from what i observe from from the outside um the, the main thing i can bring to the discussion is the the mmt analytical discussion uh, or analytical lens and one of the things that uh, uh, Sohibul showed, showed in his presentation today is the relatively low level of intervention um, that the Indonesian government uh, is, is, is putting in place and is planning on. So the, the thing that I highlighted in the beginning of the presentation today is the fiscal policy space uh, uh, you know, conversation the Indonesian government thinks that its fiscal policy space is limited. Uh, and that's why its intervention is relatively small. Uh, and notice that most countries, Indonesia included, they're thinking about the recovery in the sense of returning to pre-pandemic levels of economic activity. Uh, and to me, returning to that quote unquote normal uh, situation it's still a return to the same level of unemployment, the same level of poverty, the same level of socioeconomic exclusion. Um, that is not good enough, right? So we need to not only return to that level, but start building resilience and, and building more inclusivity in the socioeconomic system. And that means if you look at the MMT analysis, that fiscal policy space, the spending capacity is much larger than what the government is assuming. Um, the government is worried about risk of inflation, but they're following a mainstream interpretation of what causes inflation. And I think the MMT approach to identifying uh, specific areas of inflation pressure point will allow us to recognize that there's much larger spending capacity, but also will allow us to identify which areas of the economy will constitute the pressure, inflation pressure point, and as a result, develop industrial, uh, agricultural, you know, uh, economic planning that will allow us to increase the productive capacity in those areas and to regulate abusive market power in those areas so that we further increase the fiscal policy space available to us. Uh, so my, you know, um, sort of uh, very limited um, you know, knowledge of the Indonesian economy already allows me to identify that the intervention is too small. And the intervention, you know, by design is thinking about returning to the pre-pandemic levels 
which were not good enough. Uh, and I think Surya started this conversation today by highlighting uh, the constitutional requirement uh, that uh, the Indonesian government is not meeting, uh, which is you know, guaranteeing a decent quality of life, a decent job, uh, a decent and adequate level of income for every citizen. Um, so if, if the government is saying, you know, in, in the biggest intervention um, that any country has, uh, has, you know, made in recent years to, responds, to respond to the pandemic, if the Indonesian government is stopping shy of reaching that uh, constitutional mandate, uh, then it's not, by definition, it's not doing enough. Um, the problem is we know that that it's possible. We know that this is within reach. Um, so MMT provides the, the analytical framework that says, if you worry about inflation, don't follow the mainstream approach to inflation. Uh, and this is not me saying this, this is essentially all the mainstream economists and the major central banks of the world have recognized this uh, over the last 12 years. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, has, um, you, know, uh, you know, economists from the Fed has, uh, have officially, you know, acknowledged that we have no reliable uh, theory of inflation. Uh, and this is from the Fed. Uh, Mario Draghi and the, the European Central Bank uh, essentially said that we tried everything, but we have no, um, and, and even, he even said we might have to consider the MMT approach. Um, so the mainstream of the economics profession, central banking, is you know, uh, recognizing that their approach to inflation has failed. So notice, since 2008, all major central banks have been targeting inflation at 2%. And they're trying to avoid deflation, right? the inflation rate below, below zero. So they tried every trick in the textbook to spark inflation. Japan has been trying this for decades now, since the 90s. They're trying to reach an inflation rate of 2%, and they did everything they thought would raise the inflation level to 2%, and they failed, which means they're using the wrong tools, which means they don't know what actually causes inflation, because if they knew, they would have pushed inflation to 2%. So the mainstream approach to inflation is, is useless, um, and, and it's, there's plenty of evidence for this. So now the question is, do we have an alternative way to identify sources of inflation? I argue that, yes, we do, and that's the MMT framework. So let's use that approach to identify the sources of inflation, and let's use that to identify the actual limits to our spending capacity. And not only that, let's use that to identify how we can mitigate the risks of inflation. Because it's not like saying, oh, there's inflation risk, so we're not going to do anything. You can actually mitigate the risk of inflation by making those industries more competitive, more democratic, less corrupt, and by increasing the productive capacity, by using your industrial policy to produce more skills, to produce more um, machinery, equipment, technology, and so on. So the solutions are within reach. We're just providing the analytical framework to say, you know, follow these guidelines and you will be able to meet the constitutional mandates without causing inflation, without bankrupting the country, without sacrificing the democratic process. If anything, you'll make the economy and the system more democratic by reducing market power and corruption and so on. So I will translate briefly what Prof. Kabo said. In any case, uh, the video later will be subtitled in uh, uh, both languages, English and Indonesian. So if, even if I don't manage to translate everything, you can look through the video later to understand what Prof. Kabo fully has said. But before that, perhaps uh, Bukit, do you have any more to add or is it enough? If uh, I will just continue, perhaps you can uh, uh, unmute later if it's not enough, yeah? Uh, okay. Very clear, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Okay. So uh, I will translate a bit before uh, Pak Sohib, he wants to give his comments Yeah. Essentially, uh, pada dasarnya, Prof. Kabuk mengatakan, teori inflasi yang dianut arus utama itu sama sekali tidak berguna. Useless. Itu baru diakui oleh gubernur Bank Sentral Amerika, Federal Reserve ya, 
juga Mario Draghi, mantan atau gubernur Bank Sentral Eropa. Jadi, misalnya di Jepang, sejak 2000, bukan di Jepang, di seluruh dunia, sejak krisis 2008, banyak negara telah menetapkan 2% sebagai target inflasi mereka. Jepang adalah salah satu contoh negara yang berusaha mencapai target inflasi 2%. Namun, tidak berhasil, tidak pernah berhasil sampai sekarang. Jelas ada yang salah, ada kebijakan yang salah yang dilaksanakan oleh pemerintah Jepang. Jadi teori moneter modern membantu kita untuk mendeteksi sumber-sumber inflasi yang sebenarnya dan melakukan kebijakan-kebijakan yang dapat mengatasi hal-hal yang mengakibatkan uh, inflasi. Tapi sebelum inflasi dulu, yang dikatakan teori moneter modern adalah kita perlu atau setiap negara perlu meningkatkan kapasitas produktif mereka sampai mencapai batasnya, yaitu inflasi. Dan salah satu alatnya adalah kebijakan jaminan pekerjaan, di mana semua warga negara diberikan pekerjaan. Tambahan lagi kalau dalam konstitusi kita, Indonesia, juga diberikan penghidupan. Jadi job guarantee dengan basic income uh, sekaligus. Walaupun mungkin ada nanti modifikasi-modifikasi uh, dari teori-teori yang mendasari kedua kebijakan ini. Mungkin segitu dulu. That's it. I think I will let Pak, Kon Pak Sohibu continue ya. Oke, okay. I agree with Mr. Uh, Adelka, Bob. Nah, saya sudah memaparkan data-data itu, dan itu performance dari pemerintah kita. Satu hal yang saya kira harus dicatat besar-besar uh, di sini, memahami mandat konstitusi, dan melakukan sesuatu sesuai dengan mandat konstitusi itu, sambil uh, mengeliminasi berbagai faktor-faktor uh, error di dalam pembangunan, misalnya korupsi yang tidak boleh ditutup-tutupi, tapi harus diberantas. Kita juga punya lembaga dan komitmen yang selalu secara naratif uh, dibesar-besarkan, tapi tak terasa efektivitasnya. Nah, ke depan saya kira ada satu hal yang mengembirakan bahwa makin hari uh, makin banyak orang yang faham tentang uh, betapa harusnya kita uh, menghapuskan mitos-mitos ya, di dalam uh, pemahaman Uh, ekonomi kita dan uh, makroekonomi kita dan barangkali lebih banyak akademisi yang akan melakukan uh, penyesuaian-penyesuaian adaptasi tentang prinsip-prinsip dasar dalam MMT untuk diterapkan uh, kepada mahasiswa-mahasiswa mereka. Ini memerlukan waktu yang sedikit panjang tapi saya tak berharap bahwa itu akan bisa kita lalui. Melihat uh, potensi Indonesia, besarnya jumlah penduduk besarnya wilayah, besarnya sumber daya. Sesungguhnya kita tidak boleh semiskin ini. Tapi uh, karena terlalu lama dijajah oleh Belanda, zaman jajah Portugis, Inggris, Prancis, dan enam bangsa itu membuat uh, torehan yang uh, sangat uh, menyakitkan sebagai inlander yang tidak mampu dan tidak mau move on. Dan kemudian setelah kita merdeka, banyak instrumen-instrumen kelembagaan internasional Uh, seperti Bank Dunia dan uh, uh, IMF barangkali yang tidak menuntunkan secara benar perkembangan Indonesia sesuai dengan arah konstitusi kita. Nah, pandemi sekarang ini. Kalau saya butiri kembali, saya simak kembali pidato Pak Presiden, dikatakan bahwa ini adalah momentum yang penting untuk kita bertolak uh, untuk langkah lebih jauh. Ayo, jangan tanggung-tanggung. Pertama, secara filosofis, kita dalami dulu seluruh narasi yang dituangkan di dalam uh, pembukaan Undang-Undang Dasar 1945 kita. Itu mandat kita. Prioritas kita adalah melindungi segenap bangsa dan seluruh tumpah darah, memajukan secara umum, dan uh, uh, mencerdaskan kehidupan bangsa. Dengan begitu kita akan uh, punya gairah dan uh, kekuatan yang disegari dunia untuk ikut menertibkan uh, dunia serta menghapuskan uh, penjajahan di atas bumi karena tidak sesuai dengan peri kemanusiaan dan peri keadilan. Penjajahan di atas bumi itu berubah bentuk setiap saat. Dulu ada negara atau bangsa yang datang ke sini, tapi sekarang tidak lagi seperti itu. Ada hal-hal yang membuat kita independen kepada mereka. 
Dulu misalnya 30 tahun lalu, 30 tahun lalu, Cina dan India itu adalah negara yang jauh berada di, di bawah kita. Dalam ukuran kemajuan ekonomi standar kehidupan dan sebagainya. Sekarang kita hanya disejarkan orang dengan Vietnam. Itu tidak, tidak, tidak sangat, sangat, sangat tidak mengembirakan bagi saya. Ada salah urus di sini. Karena itu mitos-mitos dalam makroekonomi. Dan kemudian mental keterjajahan harus kita buang. Sambil memperbaiki hal-hal lain. Misalnya productivity yang masuk akal. Kemudian kebebasan kita untuk mengambil inisiatif ini berdasarkan uh, uh, potensi yang, yang kita miliki. Saya kira begitu, terima kasih. I would summarize what Pak Sohibul said by saying that for such a country with huge amount of natural resources, with a large number of people, with a lot of real resources, Indonesia should not be at its current stage. So what's wrong? Uh, reflecting on Indonesia's constitution, the mandates have actually been reflected uh, by the current economic theory, which is modern monetary theory, which is encouraging the policy of job guarantee. So what is uh, wrong? Of course, corruption is there, but corruption should not be interpreted in the usual manner. There are very deep studies into corruption, and uh, because of corruption, actually, uh, it's not as uh, some of us expect. We have conducted a webinar on this, especially a few weeks ago, which uh, later in the video link I will share. Also, Pak Sohibul is saying that going forward, because of the pandemic, a lot of things has, have been exposed. So we cannot stop at uh, this stage. With our understanding of modern monetary theory, with this uh, webinar and uh, the next webinars, we should be able to push, to press, to encourage, to urge our governments, government to do better, uh, especially in Indonesia. I think that's not a full summary, that's just a brief summary. And I have a message here that Juan or Juan wanted to ask, wants to ask a question. And that will be our last question because it's almost two hours in about uh, three, eight minutes because we started at 9.35, we will end this webinar. So please, uh, very young person, Juan, please. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. And this has been a great seminar. Uh, thank you uh, also to the monetary, uh, modern monetary theory uh, for real progressives group on Facebook, which uh, advertises literally just an hour before it started. And it's, it's a very interesting for uh, people, especially from our part of the world, uh, given that the whole idea of uh, monetary sovereignty, uh, as discussed, uh, in, I guess, in the academia and on the internet, uh, mostly relates to countries like the United States uh, and all the other ones that are already shown a degree of monetary sovereignty. And given that Indonesia, uh, I can feel you guys because we basically suffer from the same things, with the government that is very scared of deficits, we have a budget that somehow isn't getting dispersed. We can feel you on that, and we're basically on the same boat in this. Uh, one thing uh, I guess that I've noticed uh, because earlier uh, I've been saying about the pillars of modern monetary theories, idea of monetary sovereignty basically equates to a resilience of an economy to keep uh, its most basic things to things that it can literally produce uh, in its own borders, things that it needs where it, it can insulate itself from shocks from the outside. Uh, I guess uh, this is a comment and I guess a question as well, but isn't this one of the reasons why it's so hard to break through to orthodox economists and basically the institution of uh, economic policies in basically all countries is that there's basically this uh, hegemonic thinking in orthodox economies like for example, when it comes to building resilience, the way they will always think of doing it is to use competitive advantage, i.e. trade trade instead of trying to make it yourself. And I guess that uh, I just want to ask uh, uh, Professor Fadel if you think that this is one of the things that uh, I guess people who are looking into modern monetary theory should be preparing themselves if they are ever going to get into conversations with people who are in orthodox economics and who are probably more influential at the moment in the places that matter. 
A very good question. Thank you. So um, I, I think when we talk about the, the resistance to MMT ideas and policy space, there's two groups to think about. One is the, the policymakers themselves who are not necessarily economists. And two are the economists of the establishment who advise policymakers. Uh, I think it's much harder to uh, convince uh, economists just because the, the discipline is, is, uh, is so narrowly defined. Uh, it may be easier in developing countries because even uh, orthodox economists in developing countries have a sense of reality. Um, so I, I have more hope in a sense in the global south than in countries like the US or, or Western Europe because the, their economists are uh, less, um, in, less in tune with reality. So now it, the question becomes, you know, how do you engage with those two groups, especially policymakers, because policymakers need um, a sense of, you know, what is not working. And I think the pandemic has revealed uh, some of the deficiencies. So if, if you are convinced that it's, it's trade that builds more resilience and that having more foreign currency reserves is, is building resilience, uh, and having a strong tourism industry and a strong FDI inflow is what gives you resilience. Well, you've pro probably gave up on those ideas in the last three months because most developing countries have seen no tourism, have seen no foreign direct investment, uh, and even their export industries have uh, have been you know completely shut down in in many cases. So, so that's step number one is recognizing that what you thought was resilience was actually not. Um, the second thing is recognizing, and this is something that MMT has been, you know, doing uh, over the last few years. And thanks to, you know, Stephanie Kelton's book, which uh, yeah. in case you haven't seen it, The Deficit Myth. So what are one of the myths that we, that we talk about is are these resilience myths that some uh, countries, especially developing countries have, which is, you know, encouraging more tourism builds more resilience. Well, let's expose this, this myth. Number one, if you, you know, your economy depends on hosting millions of tourists every year, then you have to import more food to feed them. You have to import more fossil fuels to heat and cool the hotels for them and to transport uh, tourists. Uh, so the, the additional energy consumption, the additional food consumption actually reduces your resilience because now you have more food and energy imports, which means you have a larger trade deficit, which means you have, you know, you're more vulnerable to external shocks. Um, the problem is you're not the only country doing this. There's probably a hundred plus countries doing the same. So now you have to compete, right, to, for, your, for your market share. And the way to compete for your market share is by reducing your cost. How do you reduce your cost is by, you know, um, exploiting your workers, yeah. having the government subsidize energy, subsidize transportation, subsidize food, subsidize workers' retirement and health care costs. So now you're subsidizing, using government resources to subsidize an industry that's actually causing more external negative pressure on your exchange rate. That's just not right, right? So the and the larger the number of tourists that you bring, which is usually celebrated by governments, the more weakness you're bringing into your economy, not resilience. The same is true for foreign direct investment. If yeah. your economy is driven by low value added content and you're bringing in foreign direct investment that is specifically coming to your country to take advantage of lower cost of labor, lower regulation, subsidies to energy, subsidies to everything from the government, because you're competing with another 100 plus countries who are also trying to attract low value added content industries, then you're, you're losing, you're, you're subsidizing an extractive industry because foreign direct investment is not coming to build resilience to your local economy. It's coming to produce something with you know, cheap labor and subsidized resources from the government. And then it's going to take the final output and sell it somewhere else and generate profits for shareholders who are not in your domestic economy. Mm -hmm. It's literally an extractive industry. 
and yet it's something that's often celebrated by governments in developing countries. Yeah, they say, we true. brought in $2 billion worth of foreign direct investment this year, but they don't say how much of that new investment is going to be extractive and pulling resources out of the country. So mm -hmm. once we expose all of these myths one by one, and I can go on for another 10 minutes, yeah. uh, then the question is, okay, what do we do? How do we exit this trap and move to a more resilient economy. And, and I, I say this all the time, the first thing you do if, if you're stuck in a deep hole is you stop digging. You don't accelerate FDI, you don't accelerate tourism, you don't accelerate all of these things that are weakening your economy. You stop using those strategies and you move to an alternative mod model of economic development. Yeah. And that's really what, what the MMT framework is. Identify the areas where you can build more resilience by building productive capacity, making your markets more competitive, and meeting the basic needs of your domestic economy, starting with food and energy and health and, and education. Those are the basis. You're, you're not going to reach higher levels of prosperity if you can't afford food, if you can't afford energy to fuel your economy, if you can't provide basic housing and health and education for your population. Right. So that's, that's where I would take this. Thank you again for, for your question. And thank you very much. All right, thank you. I will just close by saying uh, to Prof. Fadel and to Juan, actually, we planned this webinar for, I think about two months or two or three months. Yeah, maybe three months. Early June, July, yeah, three months. And we invited uh, the mainstream economists uh, and the mainstream uh, finance people uh, and the mainstream academics, of course, yeah. Academy, uh, uh, the economists are not academics, and the academics are those who are in university. That's how I would classify it, yeah. And some of them, uh, upon receiving the invitation, agreed, but for some reason, later canceled their participation. Uh, we're not sure. So Pasohebul is telling me that what we are trying to do, what we are trying to uh, uh, have is something that is against the government. But I said to him, no, if the government, if these economists, if these academics are serious about their rhetorics, this is the way to do it. So they have done it uh, already, but they have not gone far enough. So it is, it is, it is uh, very uh, amusing to me. It is very ironic to me uh, uh, why they are not, they are not uh, as willing to participate in this uh, webinar as compared to the others in which they are just explaining what the Indonesian government is doing, you know, going through it the mainstream uh, way. And we hope that uh, with this webinar, at least, and I will send this to them also, I have their contacts, uh, and uh, good news, Prof. Kabub, uh, we have uh, the conversation, which is quite uh, read, well read by policymakers in Indonesia. They have extended an invitation for us to write in their, uh, what do you call that, in their website, yeah, the conversation. Uh, and I will send you an email later about that. And Juan, uh, later, please send me an email, yeah, suryadharma at gmail.com. I would like to get in touch with you. Uh, let's build a South, some sort of a Southeast Asian or Asian ASEAN, ASEAN caucus on uh, modern monetary theory. Yeah, uh, that should be great. Yeah, so S-U-R-Y-A-D-A-R-M-A, -A -A, that's my email. Suryadharma at gmail.com. And yeah. last but not least, Prof. Kabu, in Indonesia, uh, things are done, uh, a lot of things are done very informally. So we were hoping, I and Pak Sohibil were hoping to invite all of you, and I, I mean all, <laughs> all of the modern monetary theory uh, pioneers, experts, to Indonesia last year, because last year was our presidential election. And once you see these people face to face, uh, and exchange ideas with them, I think that's the key to opening up their minds. Not by, you know, papers, not by Twitters, not by social media, but really meeting uh, them and really, frankly, uh, talking and debating ideas. Because Indonesians, uh, they have this idea of, uh, I think Asians, yeah, they have this idea of face. Once you know someone, you cannot insult them. <laughs> or, yeah. Or uh, you'll be more open to hearing what they have to say, the recommendation and all that. 
So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. I, I usually mention all the participants' name before I end the meeting. So Aidan, Pak Aidan ya, Pak Gulam, Pak, Pak Wans, uh, Juan, uh, my father, Pak Sulaiman, Ashari, okay. Mukir, Zulfitri, okay, Pak Muklin, Pak Abiyadi, uh, Pak Sohibul's brother, Afrilia, my wife of course, Jeb Abstein, who has been silent, but I hope he's paying attention, if not to the video mm -hmm. later, if not to this one. And Pak Bukit, thank you very much, Pak Bukit, for your question. So thank you very much, everyone. Mm. Have a good evening. Have a good morning. Mm. Have a good, uh, perhaps less than evening time or more than evening time for the Philippines. And hope to see you in Wednesday on Wednesday and Friday. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And see you. Okay, see you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.